Hello and welcome to today's lecture on interfacing to the media. We have discussed various techniques such as encoding, modulation and multiplexing with the help of which you can transmit signal over medium, over any transmission medium. Now question arises, how do you interface your equipment to the transmi transmission media? It can be twisted pair, coaxial cable or optical fiber what, or wireless medium. Whatever it may be, you have to interface your equipment somehow to the transmission media. That is the topic of discussion of today's lecture. Here is the outline of the lecture. First we shall discuss the basic concept of interface where it is required. Then we shall discuss the various modes of communication between the interface and the user equipment, maybe the computer. The various modes or transmission techniques are parallel and serial or it can be simplex, full duplex and half duplex or there are two types asynchronous and synchronous transmission. And then we shall discuss about the interface between two equipments like DTE data terminal equipment and data circuit communicating equipment. So these two interface between these two have some standards one of them is uh, EIA electronic industries association developed this standard EIA 232. We shall discuss about it in details. Then we shall discuss the concept of null modem, null modem which is related to this and another interface although which is not that popular is X.21. Then we shall discuss about the modems which are actually connected to the medium. And on completion of this lecture, the students will be able to explain various modes of communication distinguish between half duplex and full duplex communication. They will be able to distinguish between asynchronous and synchronous modes of communication and they will be able to specify the RS-232C or EIA-232 uh, standard used for DT-DC interface. They will be able to explain the function of a null modem and finally, they will be able to explain the functionality and standards used for modems. Let us see what do we really mean by the interface. We have seen to send data to the transmission media, we have to do the encoding, various encoding techniques we have discussed in detail. Now that encoded data has to be transmitted and for that purpose it is necessary to interface data terminal equipment data terminal by data terminal equipment we mean the computers and various other equipments it can be computer it can be printer plotter it can be any other equipment which can transmit receive uh, data and the link between and then another equipment will be required that is known as dce data circuit terminating equipment that data circuit terminating equipment will actually interface to the medium. As you can see here, data circuit terminating equipment is connect, is interface, is now uh, sending the or launching the signal on the medium. And obviously, we have to develop interface between this data terminal equipment referred to as DTE 
and data circuit terminating equipment uh, DC. This interface uh, is an electrical circuit uh, and how we can send digital signal over this all these all these are to be uh, discussed and some standard has to be used for this purpose. So, we shall discuss about this interface in detail. Before that, let us discuss about the various uh, modes of uh, uh, transmission or rather possible modes of communication. Uh, data can be transmitted in parallel or in serial. Again, parallel has two different uh, types synchronous and asynchronous and serial also has two different variations synchronous and asynchronous. First, let us consider uh, the parallel transmission technique. In parallel transmission technique as you can see a number of bits usually a byte or a word it can be either a byte that is 8 bit or it can be word, word can be uh, 8 bit, 16 bit, 32 bit or uh, 64 bit depending on the size of the processor it can be byte or word that is sent uh, in parallel as you can see all the bits are transmitted parallel between the sender and receiver. Obviously, whenever you transmit data in this manner it is very fast because all the bits are going simultaneously. However, this is possible only over a short distance and this parallel transmission is commonly used for, tra for transmission of data between the CPU and memory or between the CPU uh, and other peripherals which are very close to the CPU. That means, when the when two uh, equipment are located very close uh, that means, within uh, within few feet or hour, uh, meters then this uh, parallel mode of communication is possible. So, uh, usually parallel mode of communication is not popular in the data transmission techniques that we are discussing in detail and in that respect normally serial transmission is used. What do we really mean by serial transmission? As you can see in serial transmission a pair of wire is used for communication of data in bit serial form you are instead of sending in parallel you are sending bit by bit as you can see here you are sending first 1 then 0 then 1 then 0 then 1 then 1 then 0 and 1. So, in bit serial fashion and of course, this will require parallel to serial conversion at the sending send by the sender and also it will require serial to parallel conversion uh, at the receiving end. However, it has many advantages uh, and that is particularly it is very suitable for uh, long distance communication. That means, the serial mode of communication is possible over long distances. So, the, the here the various reasons for using serial transmission is given and in this lecture we shall mainly focus on serial transmission and let us see what are the various techniques or why serial transmission is required. First of all, uh, it, it is it allows you reduced cost of cabling. As you have seen, we are using lesser number of uh, bits at a time only we are sending one bit at a time. So, you require one pair of wire, you do not require a bunch of wires. So, it requires lesser number of wires compared to parallel connection. In parallel communication, you require a bunch of wires to be connected between the DTE and DC which is not required here. Then it leads to reduced cross talk because of lesser number of wires it results in reduced cross talk. Uh, we have discussed about this cross talk in details and we have seen whenever a, a number of wires are bunched together it leads to cross talk and here in the serial mode of communication cross talk is reduced significantly. And third important factor is availability of CDL uh, suitable communication media. We are familiar with telephone system, microwave uh, system and satellite network. In all these cases data transmission takes place in serial form. That means, if you have to use the popular transmission media like telephone network, satellite network or microwave network, network we have to use serial mode of transmission. Uh, fourth point is 
the there are many devices which have uh, which are inherently serial in nature and in such cases it is uh, natural natural to use serial mode of communication for example whenever we read data from uh, some devices like tape recorder tape disk floppies hard disk there it is always serial in nature another important factor which is which which has becoming important in the present day context is the uh, availability of portable devices like pdas cell phones and in such cases we have seen the pdas cell phones these are very small in size and if we use a parallel connector having large number of pins uh, it is very difficult to fit in a pda or a cell phone However, if we use serial mode of communication, the number of pins required is small. So, the connector size is also small. So, only uh, small connector size can be used in for portable devices and that is why serial uh, mode of communication is uh, uh, used can be used in such cases. However, as we shall see the serial mode of communication is slower than parallel mode of communication it is much slower compared to the parallel mode of communication that is possible when we are sending data in parallel form. For example, when we are sending data between computer and main memory, their data transfer rate is very, very high. We cannot transfer data at that rate, however, that may not be required in most of the applications. Let us see the various modes. First one is simplex mode. Here, as you can see, data is unidirectional. here data is going from sender to the receiver there is no it is there is no uh, data going from the receiver to the sender it is flowing from in only in one direction for example this can be a computer and this can be a printer so in such cases uh, we can use simplex mode of communication however simplex mode cannot be always used as you can see in some situation it has to be in in both directions. So, here it is bidirectional. For example, here you have got one computer and uh, here you have got another computer. So, two, when two computers are communicating with each other, it is quite natural the data transmission transfer will be uh, in both directions. This is known as full duplex. On the other hand, the previous one when it is unidirectional, it is known as simplex. So, for full duplex communication as you can see we require two uh, I mean uh, two wires, two pairs of wires for communication of data simultaneously because here it allows simultaneous communication in both directions that is why it is called full duplex. However, there are situations in which it is not possible to have uh, uh, two separate transmission uh, links or channels. So, in such cases we have to use what is known as half duplex communication. In half duplex communication as you can see you have got only one channel, but communication is taking place in both directions. Obviously, the communication cannot take place in both directions simultaneously. In such case we have to use some protocol. For example, when a policeman is talking to his headquarter, you will find that he is talking then he is telling over then uh, then again listening for some time then he again starts talking so they have a single transmit communi communication channel through which the headquarter is communicating with that policeman so in such a case the technique is known as half duplex that means uh, a single communication channel is being used for communication in both directions but in one direction at a time this is known as half duplex communication then comes the other two techniques that is asynchronous and synchronous. Let us see what do we mean by, by asynchronous serial transmission. In asynchronous trans serial transmission, uh, what is being done instead of sending long sequences of bits at a time, uh, bits are grouped either in bytes or words and then each such character can be a uh, byte or a character 
that is 7 bit ASCII code. So, these are uh, once one is sent at a time and it is it is sent in the form of a frame. As you can see here, there is a frame for sending one such character and be, uh, each character is framed uh, with the help of a start bit in the beginning and one stop bit, one to two stop bits at the end. That means, each character has a start bit and one, one and a half or two bits of stop bits and there is an optional parity bit and the character size can be 5 to 8 data bits. So, you see we are not sending more than 8 data bits at a time and that 5 to 8 data bits is being framed with the help of a start bit, uh, stop bits and if necessary parity bit for error detection. Now, uh, whenever a sender is not sending data, the line can remain idle or that is in uh, that is you are sending essentially one, idle state of line is one and whenever data transmission is start, it, it the line is made zero signifying that a word is being transmitted and, and the data transmission ends with the help of stop bits. So, after immediately sending the stop bit, one can send another word in such case next start bit will start or it may remain idle like this. And in this case, the receiver has the opportunity to resynchronize at the beginning of each new character. So, here you can see before a particular character is received, the receiving end can synchronize with the help of this start bit. And this has many advantages as we shall see. So, here it is shown how uh, several characters have been sent from the sender to the receiver. Here you can see. Uh, one character has been sent, then there is a gap and that gap can be uh, indefinite. There is no, I mean it can be of any duration, then another, another character is sent, then uh, there is a gap and then another character is sent, then there is a gap and so on. And it has been found that this technique is very simple to Im implement, that is why it is very widely used. This is uh, quite widely used. And one important characteristic is it is self synchronizing. So, uh, we have seen that whenever data is sent by the sender at the receiving end, it has to be received and in a synchronized manner. So, that a 1 is received as 1, a 0 is received at 0 at, the, at proper bit position. If it is not received in that manner, then it will be incorrect. Here, what is being done as you have seen, it is synchronized with the help of the start bit at the middle of this start bit. Then it is sampled at the middle of each of these bits. So, as a result it gets synchronized with the with this particular edge rising edge and then uh, at the middle of each bit it is the data is sampled and to find out whether it is 0 or 1. And as a consequence the timing requirement is modest. Even if the receiver clock is 5 percent slower or faster, signal can be received correctly because uh, the synchronization is done for each character separately at the beginning of each word. But it has some limitation. The limitation is arising because of additional bits like start bit, stop bits. which is increasing the overhead. For example, you are sending 8 bit. To send 8 bit, you may require 1 stop bit plus 8 data bits plus maybe 1 parity bit plus 1 stop bit, 1 stop bit. So, 1 start bit, 1 uh, these are the data bits, this is parity bit and this is start bit. So, uh, stop bit. So, you require altogether 11 bits to send 8 data bits. So, you see there is the uh, that means 3 by 8 uh, that is roughly about say 30 um, 30 by uh, 300 by 8 that is roughly about about uh, 4 percent about 40 percent. So, 40 percent overhead is here that means to send 8 bits of data 
three additional bits are required. So, about 40 percent overhead is there and also you can think it in another way. Here you are sending 11 signal elements to send 8 bit data that means baud rate is 11 you can say if you send 8 bits per second then you are sending essentially 11 bits per second uh, signal that means 8 bit data and 11 bit signals per second that means the baud rate is 11 bit rate is or data rate is 8. So, baud rate is higher than the data rate you can think in this manner. So, this high overhead cannot be tolerated in many situations in such a situation we have to go for another alternative that is your synchronous mode of communication. So, in synchronous mode what is normally done initially one or two synchronization characters are sent instead of start bit and stop bit uh, for each uh, character. Data characters are then continuously sent without any extra bits. So, you are not sending start bit and st stop bits for each character and at the end some error detection data may be sent if necessary. The advantage is here the overhead is much less, may less than 1 percent, may be uh, uh, 0.01 percent. So, this kind of overhead is present in synchronous mode and uh, as you can see there is no overhead except for the synchronization characters. Synchronization characters are however necessary to identify the beginning of a uh, block of data. However, the main disadvantage here is there is no tolerance in clock frequency. You cannot uh, accept any tolerance because you are sending a large number of characters. If there is mismatch in frequency after few bits you, the receiving end will receive incorrect data. That is why here it is necessary to transmit in fully synchronous manner. And here is the synchronous serial transmission, how it is being done. Uh, a block of bits is transmitted in a steady stream, here is the data field, it can be very large, it can be uh, say few kilobits. And this is the, there is a preamble, 8 bit flag and some control bits and there is a postamble, postamble control fields can be uh, error codes, error correcting codes and error detection codes and 8 bit flag which is post amble. So, preamble post amble is provided uh, along with the data, but the percentage of overhead is very small. So, here the synchronization is done at higher level using preamble and post amble bit patterns as I have mentioned. So, special character is sent in the beginning at the end to mark the beginning and end of a uh, stream of data and this is the synchronous frame format. Now, here one question arises, we have told that the clocks of the two ends must be fully synchronized, how it can be done? One alternative is to send separate line for, I mean a separate line can be used for sending clock, then at the receiving end that clock will be used for receiving data, but that is not practically feasible unless two systems are located. Uh, very closely. So, in such a case the normal practice is to recover data, recover clock from the received data with the help of some suitable hardware known as phase lock loop, but that phase lock loop uh, will require some transitions and uh, we have seen different encoding techniques uh, we have discussed in detail which are used so that synchronization is possible and clock is recovered with the help of phase lock loop at the receiving end. So, the synchronous serial transmission will require complex clock recovery circuit so that synchronization is possible. Now, coming to the question of interfacing, we have this we have seen that uh, we have data terminal equipment, it can be computer or any other equipment which can send data or receive data and we require a DCE data circuit terminating equipment. This data circuit terminating equipment will, will launch the signal in this communication system and at the other end another DCE will receive that signal and will it will then uh, send the uh, signal to the DTE at the receiving end. 
and in between you will require interface at both ends between the DTE and DC. So, to uh, and DC is usually uh, the modems as we shall see and DTE are computers and various other equipment that we use for sending data. Now, the interface has to be universally accepted, so that the two equipments one DC and DT manufactured by two different companies can be interfaced. For that purpose some standards are to be used and standards have been developed by two organizations, the EIA uh, Electronic Industries Association and ITUT uh, for, for the DT DC interface. And as you, as you can see here the standards developed by EIA is known as EIA 232, EIA 442 and so on. And similarly, the ITUT standards are known as V series or X series standards. Here we shall primarily discuss the EIA standards because these are very popular. And as we shall see this interface will require three different, uh, uh, three different uh, components, mechanical, electrical, functional and procedural and let us see what are the different components do. So, here the EIA 232 standard which has got different versions A, B, C and D presently D. The mechanical specification specifies the connector type, it will require, require a connector and a cable to, uh, to connect to equipment. So, the mechanical standard specifies that and in the main standard a 25 pin male and female connector have been suggested and these uh, connectors are used for linking DC, uh, a DC with a DT. However, all the 25 pins are not used, 9 of them are commonly used as it is so, shown in this uh, particular diagram. So, subsequently a DB9 9 pin connector have been developed which is commonly used this is smaller in size and uh, the various signals uh, that is present on these pins are also shown here. Then the electrical specification uh, gives you the logic levels, the maximum cable length and the maximum data rate, baud rate which can be, can, which can be used for communi communication between DT and DC. As you can see in EIA 232 c the uh, electrical signal levels are not TTL compatible that it is not 0 volt for 0 and plus 5 volt for 1. So, uh, so uh, it is not true. So, uh, as you can see here for logic 0 the range is plus 3 to plus 25 usually uh, plus 12 volt is used. On the other hand for logic 1 minus 3 to minus 25 volt is used in practice minus 3 12 volt is commonly used for this purpose. So, we see the electrical specification specifies the electrical voltage levels, the maximum cable length and the maximum baud rate. So, these are these are the three parameters specified by electrical specification. Then comes the functional specification, it specifies what are the different signals that you require signal lines that you requires and they can be broadly divided into four types data, data, the data lines, control lines, timing lines and ground lines. And uh, for EIA 232 c basically nine lines are used as I have, as I have shown here. Uh, for example, this, uh, this is a ground signal, then this transmit data and receive data. Uh, transmit data and receive data, these are the data lines, then your carrier detect, DC ready, uh, clear to send, ring indicator, these are the signaling signals, those uh, timing signals and some of them are control signals. I shall explain the function in the next specification that is the procedural specification. This procedural specification tells, specifies the sequence of events that will take place for transferring data. So, uh, to send data you have to use a, sequ uh, a sequence, so that the, uh, the, uh, the uh, transmitter and receiver can communicate with each other, each other 
it is some kind of protocol, the agreed upon uh, uh, protocol that is being used for the communication between the two systems. Uh, for example, DSR data set ready and data terminal ready are used to check whether both devices are ready for communication. That means, these two DSR and DTR will be used for, uh, uh, for establishing uh, the fact that both are ready for communication, both have been turned on. On the other hand, uh, the request to send and clear to send, these are the handshaking signals for transferring before uh, transmission of data can be started and the transmit and receive, these two are used for transmitting data between DC and DT. Let us see how it is exactly, exactly being done. So, here we see uh, a DT on one side, DT on the other side, this is a DC modem A, modem B and connected through a transmission media. So, first the uh, DT sends the DT ready signal to the modem in response to that the and also it sends the uh, you know that telephone number you know that uh, it is connected through the telephone system. So, telephone number is sent through the data lines. So, in receiving that the modem sends the uh, ringing signals that goes to the other end and uh, whenever the modem receives it a ring indicator signal go to the other end DTE. In response to that the DTE sends DTE B at the other end sends that uh, DTE ready signal which in which informs the modem that the DTE is ready for receiving data and in response to that a carrier signal is sent by this modem B to the modem A and after receiving that carrier signal modem A sends a uh, DC ready signal uh, in informing that DC that this DC or modem is ready for the transmission and in response to and also it sends a carrier signal to the other end uh, and after receiving that modem sends a uh, signal detector to the DTB and uh, now the system is ready for communication. A link or channel has been established, now the both DTEs are ready for communication. How it is done? Let us see. So, here as you can see uh, uh, before transmission of data, the DTEA sends a request to send informing the modem that uh, asking the modem whether the it can send data or not. In response to that modem responds uh, giving a signal, handshaking signal known as clear to send and after receiving that the DTEA will send the data, transmitted data uh, and which will go to the other end and at, as it goes to the other end uh, as you can see the DTEB will receive the data. After receiving the data the communication is complete. This is how at the beginning of each uh, communication the uh, for sending each character of data request to send then clear to send and this is followed by transmission of data uh, to the other end. So, this is how character by character is sent one after the other uh, between two DTEs. So, apart from RS 232 C, RS 232 uh, communicate uh, the uh, standard, some other standards have been developed by uh, Electronic Industries Association. I am briefly comparing the RS 232 C with two other standards RS 420, 423 and RS 422. The reason for that is that RS 232 was developed long back when the uh, data rate requirement was much smaller. As we have seen uh, only, uh, only 20 kilo, uh, 20 k bits per second can be sent which is very low in today's standard. So, to improve the uh, performance this RS 423 and RS 422 were introduced as you can see the baud rate here is more 300 k for RS 423 and 10 megabits per second for RS 422. And then the cable length is also increased instead of 50 feet for RS 423 it is 4000 feet and also for RS 422 it is 4000 feet. And these are the output voltage levels plus 5, 
plus 25 to I have already explained plus 5 to plus 25 for 0 and minus 5 to minus 25 for 1. Uh, on the other hand for R s 4 to 3 is plus 3.6 to plus 6 for uh, 0 and plus 3.6 minus 3.6 to minus 6 for 1, but here it is 2 to 6 volt between outputs. Here it is balanced, balanced means differential as you can see, differential means the data is sent between two wires. When it is unbalanced, you are sending data through one wire and, and a, there is a common ground line. On the other hand here, there is a common ground line, but the data is sent between these two wires, that is why it is called balanced. This is, this helps to uh, reduce the uh, noise, because all the noise passes through the signal as a result, whenever it, you use unbalanced or single ended communication, there is, a, there is a noise immunity is much less compared to the balanced mode of communication. Here, because of higher data rate and longer distance, this balanced mode of communication is necessary. So, input threshold is in this case minus 3 to plus 3 for RS 232C and here the threshold is much less minus 0.2 to plus 0.2 and same is true for RS 422. So, these are the input resistances here high input impedance 4 k more than 4 k here it is 3 k to 7 kilo ohm. So, in brief, this is the comparison of the other standards and here is a important concept known as null modem in the context of this uh, DT DT interface. We have seen that whenever the data transmission has to take place over long distance, the two DTs will require two DCs and then through telephone network communication can be done. However, when two DTs are in the same room. The same interface may be used, uh, but there is no need of any DC. In such a case, the concept of null modem is used. That means, whenever the communication is over a very short distance, there is no need for any DC. However, we can make use of the uh, good old RS-232 or EIA-232. How it can be done is explained here. So, instead of this DC telephone network and DC at the other end, this is being replaced by a cable. So, null modem is nothing but a cable as you can see, however, the cables are the wires are swapped. It is because the it, it is transmit line, so transmit signal has to go to the receive line and this transmit signal has to go to the receive line. So, a null modem is nothing but a cable with two female connectors at both ends. In the previous case, here we use female connector, here we use a male connector. Similarly, here is a female character, here is a male connector. But in this particular case, we have to use female connectors at both ends, because both ends are DTs and wires are swapped as necessary uh, for communication between two DTs. But the important point is DT is uh, fold here. DT has the illusion that it is connected to a modem, but in practice it is not, it is connected to a uh, cable and that cable is connecting to the other DT. So, uh, this is the null modem concept. Whenever uh, we have to use that 25 pin, can, pin connector, some of the wires have to be looped back and some of the wires has to be cross connected and various uh, cross connections and loop backs lines are shown in this null modem when 25 pin connectors are used that is used in the standard RS-232. Another uh, standard which have been proposed by ITUT to overcome the limitations of EIA-232 uh, is the X.21. So, this X.21 was designed by the ITUT to overcome the limitations of EIA-232 and pave the way of all digital transmission. That RS-232 was developed in the era of analog, analog transmission or analog communication. On the other hand, that X.25-21 was developed to facilitate digital transmission. What has been done here? Most of the control circuits are eliminated by data traffic, so that the number of pins required is small and uh, uh, it is replaced by data traffic 
that means uh, with lesser pins, but data lines are used for sending the control signals and it works in balanced circuits as I have already explained and data rate is 64 kilobits per second. So, it is uh, re relatively high compared to 20 kilobits per second and it uses a 20 15 pin connector which is known as DB15 connector and there are various timing signals used for byte control. Here it uses timing lines for byte control and pin 3 and pin 5 which are control and indication are used for handshaking as we have seen that request to send clear to send are used in case of RS232 to 32 here that uh, control and indication lines are used for that purpose. So, in brief uh, this gives the overview of X.21. Now, we shall require another important com uh, component for interfacing DT to the uh, communication media. We have seen that interface now the modem uh, is required and we have already discussed modem in details. As you know a modem, a modem stands for modulator plus demodulator. So, it is a it performing two functions modulation and demodulation and a modulator as you know converts digital signal into an analog signal using ASK, FSK, PSK or QAM modulation techniques which we have discussed in details earlier and the demodulator converts an analog signal in back into digital signal. Here there are two important parameters as you know the transmission rate and the baud rate. Here are the various baud rate and data rate explained based on different uh, modulation techniques as you have as you have seen the using smaller baud rate we can achieve higher uh, bit rate or data rate. It can be if we use 256 QAM, it can be 8 times. For example, if we are using the typical uh, telephone line having the bandwidth of 2400, that is the baud rate uh, with and so we can multiply it by 8 if we use 256 QAM, that will be the data rate. So, 8 into um, 2400 that can be the data rate in this particular 256 QAM. And some modems have been developed by ITUT and Bell, Bell laboratories. Bell laboratories are known as the modems developed by Bell laboratories are known as Bell modems and uh, ITUT developed modems are known as V series modems. So, some of the standard modems are shown here. Uh, and they are some of them are equivalent as you can see V.21 is equivalent to Bell uh, 103 Bell modem having baud rate of 300, bit rate of 300 and modulation use is FSK and V.22 is the ITUT standard and Bell modem standard is 212 having baud rate of 600, bit rate of 1200, it uses 4 PSK phase shift keying. And V.23, which is equivalent to Bell modems 202, uses baud rate of 1200, bit rate of 1200, uses FSK, phase shift keying, frequency shift keying. V.26, uh, Bell modem equivalent is 201, uses baud rate of 1200, bit rate 2400, using 4 PSK, phase shift, 4 P, uh, phase shift keying. And V.27 uses uh, it is equivalent to Bell modem 208, baud rate of 1600 and bit rate is 4800 using 8 PSK and V.29 uh, which is equivalent to Bell modem 209 provides baud rate of 2400 with bit rate of 9600 that uses 16 QAM. And there are other standards and providing at most 33.6 uh, kilobits of kilobits per second of data transfer uh, using modems. That is the maximum possible data transfer rate possible in using modems. Now, here is the standard modem operation explained how it is connected to the telephone network and how it works. As you can see, this is the DT or the computer, and here are the modems and this is the interface it can be RS232C, RS232 
or EIA 232, whatever you call it. And these are the two modems at the at both ends. And these modems are connected by local loop to the switching exchange. And in the switching exchange, it is converted into digital form by using PCM. And so, that digital data goes through the digital telephone network and at the, to the telephone network. And at the other end, it is again converted by inverse PCM and that goes to the another to the other side of the modem and again that interface is there which is connected to DTE. That is how the communication takes place. And because of the, uh, the quantization possible, uh, quantization is done in PCM, we have to it is the data transmission is re restricted by Nyquist rate which I have already discussed in detail. And based on that, uh, maximum data rate possible is 33.6 kilobits per second. So, data transmission rate is not really very high. It can, you cannot go beyond this when you have got uh, this system. However, nowadays another types of modems which are becoming popular which are known as 56 k modems. You may be asking how it is possible to transmit at such high rate of 56 kilobits. Does it violate Nyquist criteria? In practice it is not. Let us see how it is being done. This 56 k modems can be used when the other end is uh, not connected to the uh, standard analog telephone system, but it is digital one which is essentially the internet service provider. As you can see, uh, the there are two types of signals present here. One is going from this DTE uh, through the through the modem to the local loop using the PCM and it goes to the internet to the internet service provider. So, in this uh, in this uploading direction data transfer rate is still 36.33.6 kilobits per second because of the presence of PCM here in in this uh, in this particular direction. However, when the data is being sent by the internet service provider through the digital telephone network, then there is no PCM involved here. The data is going through the inverse PCM and it is going uh, through the local loop to the modem. In such case, the data transmission rate possible is 56 kilobits per second. So, in the uh, downloading direction or downlink direction as you can see high data, the data transfer rate is possible in the reverse direction. So, the reason for that is in this case uh, that PCM is not present. So, uh, that Nyquist, the, no, no question of quantization error and no, no question of violation of the Nyquist rate. So, we find that the 56 k modems allows you data transmission at higher rate from the internet to the uh, user and which in uh, particularly in that direction we require higher, higher data rate. Usually we, we are downloading uh, more data from the internet then we are sending uh, towards the internet. So, here is the uh, 56k modems. So, uh, in summary in this lecture to summarize in this lecture we have discussed about the interface between the uh, data terminating equipment that is your computer and other peripherals and the data circuit terminating equipment or DC which is commonly a modem and uh, the, the standard interface that is EIA 232 has been discussed in detail. Other standards also we have discussed uh, briefly like X.21 and some other in, uh, standards proposed by EIA like EIA 422 and EIA 423. Uh, and we have discussed the operation of modem, how modem communicates through the telephone network between two DTs and also we have discussed the function of uh, the, X, uh, the 56k modem in detail, how it provides you higher data rate. Now, it is time to give you review questions on this lecture. Here, uh, the first question is distinguish between hub duplex and hub duplex, uh, uh, hub duplex and full duplex transmission, it will be full. 
dis distinguish between half duplex and full duplex transmission. Second question is why serial transmission is commonly used in data communication instead of parallel transmission. Third question is distinguish between asynchronous and synchronous serial modes of uh, data communication. Fourth question is why is null modem, what is null modem and when can it be used. Fifth question is in what way standard modems differ from 56A modems. The, uh, these questions will be answered in the next lecture. Coming to the answers to the questions of lecture number 13, first question was distinguish between the services provided by cable TV and HFC networks. Answer is the standard cable TV service allows distribution of broadband TV signals to a large number of people. Here data transmission is, uh, is only in one direction. On the other hand in HFC that hybrid fiber coaxial network, the data transmission is in both directions. So, it in addition to broadcasting TV signal in the downstream direction, it allows broadband internet service which is bidirectional through the cable network. Second question was uh, how the upstream bandwidth is shared by a group of users for data transfer in HFC network. As we know only 6 channels are available in the upstream direction. Uh, so, each channel is shared by a group of users uh, in the same neighborhood. For this cable modem, uh, for this the cable modem uh, has to negotiate with the CMTS in the distribution hub. You know that CMTS is present in the distribution hub to content for a channel. Then the CM can send data to the internet in the already allocated channel using TDMA, time division multiple access. So, this concept of multiple access will be discussed in more detail later on. Then the third question uh, was how is an STS multiplexer different from an add drop multiplexer? Answer is an add drop multi multiplexer operates in the line layer of sonnet and it can add signal coming from different sources into a given path or remove a desired signal from a path and redirect it without demultiplexing the entire signal. On the other hand, STS multiplexer operate, multiplexers operate in the path layer and it uh, either multiplexes signal from multiple sources into a STS signal or demultiplex an STS signal into different destination signal. We have seen that STS multiplexer signal is responsible for converting electrical signal to optical signal and optical signal to electrical signal. Fourth question was what is the relationship between STS and STM? The standard developed by NC is known as synchronous optical network SONET, whereas another very similar standard developed by ITUT is known as synchronous digital hierarchy or SDH. Their relationship is shown in this table. As you can see, OC1 is not present in SDH equivalent, has no SDH equivalent. On the other hand, OC3 is equivalent to STM1, OC12 is equivalent to STM4, OC14 is, equi 45 is equi 48 is equivalent to STM16, OC192 is equivalent to STM64, OC768 is equivalent to STM256. These are some of the uh, popular uh, signal levels shown here and we, we have already discussed in detail the line rate, payload rate and overhead rate for the different levels. The final question was how does SONET carry data from DS1 service? The answer is to make SONET backward compatible with the uh, current DS hierarchy, the frame design of SONET includes a system of virtual tributaries in which more than one tributaries are interleaved column by column. And SONET is also provided with the mechanism to identify each VT virtual tributary and separating them without demultiplexing the stream. So, with this come to an end of today's lecture. Thank you.